Hi, my name is Carolina and welcome to my podcast. This is my second episode recorded in English and it is another interesting interview from the Second Congress for Integrative Medicine in Warsaw where I had the pleasure to talk to some of the experts in medicine and health. Without further ado, let me introduce my second English-speaking guest, Dr. N. Lee Smith. Dr. Lee Smith specializes in internal and behavioral medicine. As an associate professor of medicine, he created the Stress Medicine Clinic at the University of Utah Health Sciences Center. He has taught about mind-body interaction and the research behind it widely throughout the United States and co-authored the textbook Mind-Body Health. Over the years, he has developed effective methods to practically implement the principles of stress resilience in enjoyable ways that optimize health and total well-being. During our conversation, Dr. Lee Smith explains the topic of his lecture and his area of expertise. He also talks about what integrative medicine means to him and defines the changes that are required for the medical system to be more integrated and the treatment to be more holistic. So for those that could not make it to your lecture, uh, if uh, you could briefly <coughs> tell us what was the briefly, main... Briefly, how, how brief? Very brief. In a few <laughs> sentences, what's the main idea, the main topic right. of, your, of your lecture today? Okay. So today, as a summary, we talked about lots of health science studies showing the very important effects of mental stress and distress or well-being on physical health and well-being. Um, we looked a little bit at why the most common medical diseases are related to an overactive nervous system often driven by the part of our brain called the amygdala that drives fear-based judgmental thoughts. Um, it's like we have two minds, this amygdala fear-based side and also the prefrontal cortex which is the wise and loving mind and when you activate the wise and loving mind, the fearful judgmental mind and all of that nervous system oversensitivity quiets down. Then we uh, talked about how spiritual practices have been proven to activate this prefrontal cortex, the wise and loving mind, and to inhibit the overactive amygdala that causes a lot of diseases. Uh, the practices, there are many non-spiritual practices that also activate the wise mind, but the spiritual ones give a certain power and feeling for motivation to do it regularly, and it takes practice, not just talking about it. As it is a Congress for Integrative Medicine, could you give us your definition of this integrative approach to medicine? Uh, my field of medicine is in behavioral medicine, which is the interaction between the mental and the physical aspects of health. And um, the data that we've collected from hundreds of studies shows that four mental principles clearly are related to better physical, mental, and social well-being. Those four principles are uh, an internal sense of control, so I'm not being controlled by what's going on, but I'm in charge of me, and that's half of the distance in the problem. When that three felt, a sense of connectedness to other people, to one's deep self, to sources of spiritual power, um, a sense of purpose and meaning, both about one's life and work, and about this event right here in front of me and hope, optimism, that we can deal well with whatever arises. Those four things are clearly powerful mental principles that affect physical health outcomes, not only who gets sick, but if you do, who gets well faster and cuts down on medical visits and costs and the like. So. Anything that you can do mentally 
that bring out the sense of control, connectedness, purpose and meaning and hope is likely to improve total health. So do you think that um, putting those principles into life is essential for the approach to medicine to change, for it to be more holistic and yes. integrated? Yes, and these are not subtle, small changes. These are big changes. We produced, we, we discussed data for reducing heart attacks by 50%, which is better than any of the other stress or uh, cardiac risk factors. Um, and putting it into practice is a key word. If you just talk about it, if you just give a person uh, good information to go in and say, go do it, nothing changes. But if you have practices, and this is one of the things that the spiritual groups do, is they're regular, literally practicing being in the wise and loving mind. And literally, you can see it grow over years of time, <laughs> that part. Um, but the key word is you have to practice it regularly in some kind of way. The issue that I see is that in the situation we have now, we need to come, we need to start this initiative as patients, as human beings. Whereas, don't you think it should be from the on the system side to introduce those practices to oh, encourage yes. patients to do that? Because I can't yes. see this in the in the Western uh, health system. Well, you have to prove that it works, and we now have data that proves that it works, but it's a different paradigm. Uh, the health system sees things in, in um, kind of more limit, the studies are more limited. Mm -hmm. uh, you use a, a one body system or you use a short term study. And the kind of things we're talking about are changing a person's whole way of being. People are very complex. And it's, it's harder to do studies unless you do them long term. I showed some studies that were, uh, you know, anywhere from four to 80 years long, and, and there are these striking long term effects. But you've got to prove it, that it works, and you need to prove the mechanisms. And we talked about, you know, immunity and mm -hmm. hormones and different kind of things. So you have to talk the language of the current system and the science and then show how some of these traditional practices that are great ancient sages are going to make you happier and healthier and less suffering. I mean, that's what they were, that was their goal. Uh, as long as we do that, you can change it. However, it usually takes a generation or two because the experts, for good reasons, this has not been part. And you know, I'm the expert in heart disease. What does meditation have to do with heart disease? And and, and so you know, you you show these studies, and it's just uncomfortable for an expert. But the next generation who sees it and is open-minded wants to figure out how to how to meditate in a way that will improve heart attacks. So hopefully for the next generations, th these practices will be a normal part of their daily life and disease prevention. Oh, I can tell you that from my own life experience. When I was introducing this at my university 25 years ago, there was a lot of resistance. And I even did studies in the clinics and showed that this was working. <laughs> and there was still resistance. Still. But the younger physicians, the residents who were in training, saw this happening and now they're the professors and and we're seeing this whole thing in my lifetime this whole mind body and now is bringing in spirit thing has evolved immensely yeah so let's be hopeful that it progresses oh yeah the next generation i think you'll see this is mainstream medicine there's another important piece uh, about the future of medicine one of the big things in the future of medicine is going to be genetic engineering. I mean, it's huge, but there are huge ethical issues. We talked about, you know, these two minds. Well, am I going to use my wise, we 
together mind to use this powerful technology. It's like nuclear technology. I can, I can use it to solve the problems of society and health and healing with genetic engineering, for example, or I can use it to destroy the enemy. And so which of these minds has to be a whole level of maturation of the whole society, not just the individual? This whole thing we talked about, which mind are we going to use? And we talked about two minds because in, when you activate one, the wise and loving mind, you inhibit the fearful, separate, judgmental, me versus you, us versus them. When you get into the us versus them, you inhibit the wise, connecting, loving mind. That, that's been shown on studies in, in scanning. And when we're aware that we have these two minds, and the difference between them, and we, all, and we all use both of them, I can tell which one I'm in right now. Well, is this the one I want to be in, which is often our habits, or are there ways to change my habits to, with practices to be more in wisdom and compassion and good judgment? And as we do that, the ethics just kind of naturally begin to flow. I'll know whether we're gonna use our technology to beat out the other guy, or we're gonna use it to draw us closer together as a, as a greater people. And also it is our choice. It's our choice. When you know the difference between these two minds, you have a choice. Which one am I gonna uh, feed and grow? <laughs> so what you're trying to say is that the ethical issue is that once we have the help of the modern technology, we might have thoughts and ethics implemented into our brains that are not necessarily ours, and that would cause damage on the ethical level. But yeah, ethics is how do we get along as a we, uh, together, a connectedness. And the unethical things are the other side, the us versus them, and who's right and who's wrong and who's got the power. And uh, this, this is a huge issue. and. And society is not maturing wisely as fast as the technology for having power to do things is developing. And we've just got to be ready to know how to use it. It, it really is like nuclear power. Do we use it to destroy the other or solve the energy problems of the world? So hopefully the next um, lectures will help us understand this issue even I, deeper. I certainly hope so. Yeah. Thank you so much <laughs> okay. once again. You bet. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you want me to produce more content in English, rate and review this podcast or leave a comment under this episode on YouTube. I release new interviews every Monday at 4 p.m. Until next time.